Hi everyone, Ed McGrogan here with Pete Bodo, the racket scientist. We're back for another video. This one on a post uh, you titled ATP Politics. And I think uh, the inspiration with this was for a few reasons. There was the main blue clay debate. There was some increased prize money going on at the slams, all really tying back to the power that the players have and really the interaction with ATP leadership. And, and that's um, where some of your comments came in here. One that, that really hit on that, um, and, and maybe you wanted to elaborate on, was from P Space, writing that, um, you know, about the blue clay issue. Um, he was saying that there's a board of seven people split between the players, some officials, and then the old CEO, Adam Helfand, and that's where kind of, that's where things, this decision was made, really. Um, and and the, the, the quote I wanted to read from the comment is, quote, I think the main idiocy of this whole issue is even putting it up for a vote. You do not try a new surface on an ATP Masters, do it in a challenger for a couple of years, then make the switch. So first I just want to ask about the actual board, if that's entirely accurate. Well, no, it's not accurate, and I think, you know, P-Space is partially right, partially wrong. He's right in a sense, I, I believe he's right in that this should have been played, a regular tournament should have been played on his surface before. That was a, a big mistake not to play one, even if you thought everything was going to go great, as they did think. But I think more importantly, people don't understand that this is not, this is not a board issue. Uh, the color of the blue clay, basically, is an ATP uh, a CEO issue. He checks off on a color. He doesn't have to go back to the players or anybody else. And it's, it's really only done for practical reasons because when was color ever a problem? I mean, basically when Australia went to the blue court, nobody's complaining about that court. People love it, etc. So color has never been a problem. The problem here has been that clay, the composition of the clay court itself, be in addition to the different color, was in question. Now, the, impo the interesting thing is if you're going to change the surface, it has to go through the ATP board. And then you could still come with the same conclusion. But, you know, so, and, and this raises a lot of interesting questions. For instance, when is a change of, you know, when is a change of surface really a change of surface instead of just, say, an ambient neutral thing like the color? You know, I mean, every clay court plays differently. We know yeah. that. Yeah, for this one here, the, the main issue was, um, you know, it, it was more about the playability, I think, in the end. And that was, I think, a little unexpected after, we've heard about blue clay for a little while now. And, and even that point about having a challenge and I know um, Ion Tyriac wants to do that, and, and I've also read that they, they even have, they've even had blue clay practice courts there in Madrid in previous years. But I think what got out of hand with this was that, um, you know, the, the finished product just it wasn't the right recipe for whatever reason. And well, no, the composition of the court was a problem. Basically, they, they blew it, and part of that maybe was the fault of the city of Madrid that does not allow them to keep the courts in place. Those courts, whether they're red or blue or yellow or orange or black, are going to be replaced every year, or they have been up to now. Up now, to now right. in light of this controversy, they've agreed to keep those things. But the important thing to remember here is that this is, this is a board decision when it's a change of surface. It's going to raise some issues and questions as to, as to where that line is between a substantial change in quotes, I suppose, that really makes a difference in how the thing plays and, and what is, you know, and, and besides, who's going to define a clay court surface? Hard true is a turn, they have, they have tournaments on hard true and that's a much fast, that's a lot like the blue clay that they had in Madrid. So it, there's going to be interesting discussions going on here. The two players that made the most um, noise about that, Rafael Nadal, Novak Djokovic, both um, lose relatively early by their standards in Madrid. Very vocal about their disdain for the changing of the clay, uh, whether it be tradition-based or playability-based. I think there was a little of both in both players. So Ada wrote um, about this, is that, quote, my guess is that they would remain disgruntled as long as they feel they're being bossed around by the ATP administration and the tournament directors. And I think the theme of her whole comment here is, um, you know, the larger issue is as this is not going to go away anytime soon, and quote, I believe the players have a right to complain, and we tennis fans have a right to dissect those complaints any which way we see fit, which is kind of what we're doing right here, actually. Well, so. exactly. And my yeah. criticizing them is also a right, yeah. you know, and to dissect, you know, what they say. So let's be frank about that. And who's going to argue with the rights of the players to say what they want? That's, that's you know, that sounds good. That's on the ramparts kind of rhetoric, but it's, it's kind of meaningless. The important thing, really, you know, to me in, in this context, I think, is to acknowledge that the players, you know, you know, in what sport do the players write the rules? Now, this raises a very interesting issue, which, in fact, Jan Tyriak, oddly enough, was the guy at the point of this because when the ATP tour was formed and the players decided to get into the business with the tournament directors 
of promoting the tournaments, Ian Tyriak said that, well, it's, that's it, the players no longer have a union. And that's actually very, very true. So now, you know, the, the other aspect of this is that because the players are a vested partner in this, in this group. It's not the AT, what's this about the ATP guys bossing them around? It's, it's their guys. They're the people who, who constitute this. Now, you can argue about whether some guys should have made a judgment call on, on some change in the rules or on, on a blue court even. Health fan is the one who approved the blue court, didn't need anybody else's backing. It was his decision. You know, but, the, but this underscores the extent to which the players do not have a union. And that's always been an issue that we've seen pop up a while in terms of, um, for example, last year's U.S. Open when you saw the – um, players complaining about the the amount of rest they had for the Super Saturday issue kind of ties back. It's really that the representation isn't there to do much against these bigger tournaments, and 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 this is I think another example of of the lack of cohesiveness among all tennis players. It kind of gives most of the power to the you know the tour leadership here. So yes, and that was by design. That's something that you've got to stress. The players wanted to, in their words, take control of the tour. They came up they came up with the mechanism for it. They hired the guy who did it. So you know there's no blame to be and I'm not saying this justifies everything or, or that it explains or exonerates anybody. I'm just saying look this is this is the way the thing was designed to work and it's working the way it was designed. The other the other issue you have to bring up here is is you know just to what degree should a contemporary current player have power to change or have what kind of voice should they have in the change of any kind? And, you know, when, when it comes to things like change of surface, you know, Pat Cash was the Wimbledon champion. I what was it, 80, 87? Next year, they changed the Australian Open from grass, Cash's best surface, to, 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 to a, a cement court. Now, I mean, boy, you talk about a change. You right, know, that neutralizes, a change. Yeah, that neutralizes his net rushing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. U.S. Open goes from grass to hard true, green hard true clay, much like the blue clay in Madrid. Where were all the giant complaints and where was everybody thinking how terrible this is and all? You know, it's just, look, it was, it was anti-innovative. The vested interests are, are always going to look out for their own best interests. That's what I think Nadal and Djokovic were doing. Should the Wimbledon grass become blue as well? That's kind of the, you know, we, got, we did get a lot of quotes about this. I know I think you, actually, you, you found the blue clay actually, you know, it, it wasn't, the results of playability might not have been there, but I think you thought the, the idea actually maybe turned out pretty well. But I think a lot of people, Zola wrote that one, um, quote, you are echoing the voice of Tyriac, a multi-billionaire who does not give a damn about the players. All he wants is more money. What do you think about Tyriac in this whole thing? Because he, he comes off certainly, I think, in most people's eyes as kind of a villain in this whole thing. And, you know, he's been viewed kind of in that light for a while. But just, you know, the end of this whole thing, where does he go from here? Look, I mean, that comment, by the way, I think is totally out of line. I was accused by others, you know, in, in that same thread of conversations of being a related to Tyriac, which I am not. I am no blood kin to Jan Tyriac, everybody. I was also accused of being on a take on Tyriac's payroll. I am not on Tyriac's payroll, everybody. The bottom line is a lot of these people have no sense of tennis history. It isn't like tennis that Tyriac is some crazy Romanian billionaire who's trying to rip off the system and make a ton of money. The guy was a former player. He was a French Open doubles champion. He did a lot of very questionable things in his life and career, and I actually called him out on those and had numerous conflicts with him and as well as some of his clients like Guillermo Vilas at one time. However, the bottom line is the guy knows the game. You can't call this guy anti-player. This guy has been a player. He's managed players. He's a manager and coach of of Boris Becker, Goran Ivanasevich, uh, any number, Henri Leconte, Guillermo Vilas. I mean, this guy has done everything in tennis as a player, as well as a manager, as well as a coach. So don't tell me he's, that he's some billionaire who stumbled in there like with some new play thing. No, and he's also, but he's also a very innovative, forward-thinking guy. He increased prize money 28%, I believe, higher than the prize money being paid in Rome was being paid by Madrid. When you do that kind of thing, you've got to come up with some ways to sell tickets, to be innovative. I think it's an experiment that was well worth making. I hope it goes on. It was made for a racket scientist post. I think we can safely say that. Um, we'll be back with more videos. In the coming weeks, thanks again for Pete Bodo. I'm Ed McGrogan.